it's pretty epic. Because the uh, the Great Lakes are like it's like the the ocean people don't realize are right there. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> I mean, oh god, yeah. Take a bike ride through there, and you head down, go down, you ride along the lake there. It feels, yeah, it almost feels like Southern California, like you know when it's hot and the vibe until is the right. uh, <laughs> until the weather turns. That that lake effect is no joke, man. I mean, that yeah. uh, there was one day I remember where. We went bike riding. It was like spring, like April. And you're like, oh, it's like 65, 70 degrees. Great. And then by the time we were turning around at the lake, it was hailing in 40. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh-uh. Yeah, it definitely oh, gets God. cooler by that lake. Significant right. drop. Sure does. Okay, I'm going to just dive right in. Let's do um, all right, for the radio audience, please tell us where you are, who you are, and what you're trying to do with your art form. Um, my name is David Shaw. I sing and write songs with my band, The Revivalists. And uh, that's a tough one, but I'd say, um, you know, I want to reach as many people and touch as many hearts as I possibly can with my art. Are you in New Orleans right now? In New Orleans. Yep, in New Orleans, Louisiana. Sorry about that. <laughs> You know, this season feels like the New Orleans season. You know, it's just something special about all my favorite musicians being down there. I just talked to these guys in the Deslons, who I'm a big fan of. Um, yeah, I know and, Sam. And, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Because I was down there uh, with my one year old and my wife, and we were tooling around. I was like, I got to see if I can get him over here. And we just like set up the mic, you know, in, in the little apartment as everyone was running around, and yeah, it man, really worked crazy. out. Great band. Um, and uh, man, I just finally got a chance to hear the new record. Really, really exciting stuff, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're 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 pretty excited about it for sure. Worked a long time on it. Many Pour it out into the night. Yep. It's kind of like what we try to do as live performers, right? Leave it all behind. Absolutely. Absolutely. But what is that? What is that phrase? What is the message of the record for you, if there is one? You know, and I don't want to be too pandemic y, but, you know, there were so many moments during that time that, you know, I would go out into my little studio in the backyard at 2, 3 a.m. and just let it all out, you right. know? Uh, it was a tough, it was a tough time for me in a lot of ways. It was a good time for me in a lot of ways. But it was also really tough. You know, our industry completely shut down. We didn't know right. what was going to happen. Um, so I put it all into the music really. Um, and that was, and it, and, you know, it ended up being a lyric in one of the tunes and the title uh, of the song. And it just kind of felt fitting. It's also something that we kind of do. We've done um, in the past is take a lyric from the song and that is that's what we named the album after so it was kind of like that one felt the most fitting and it feels like that that track almost has like is it like a nylon string like a spanish style guitar that starts it's off a, it's actually a little uh, it's called a gatelli which oh, is okay it is a it is a it is a nylon string but it's the size of a ukulele but it's the six string I have one right here, actually. I, yeah. Uh, it is kind of like a great thing to travel around with. Like, I got oh, it from exactly. like at a at a Yamaha like guitar demo. Uh, not going to exactly. lie, it sounds pretty terrible most of the time. But like when it's in tune, it actually has this beautiful, uh, yeah, kind of ringing Chinese you know, vibe. The, yeah, exactly. That's the thing. It was like I, I kind of I was playing around with it one day. And I just like turned the reverb up way too, you know, just like past what it would be ever, you know, be right. a thing, which is, you know, and then I just kind of stuck it up with this ribbon mic and it had this like really nice, that's that, that's that line through the tune that you hear kind of. Right. Oh, it just kind of created a little, a, a unique sound for me that I was, I was into. Do you feel like when you get up on stage, that you are creating a new character that you're not just yourself, that you're almost um, 
embodying who you want to be or who you feel like you could be? Or do you feel like this is your most true self when you're performing? It's that, that is a really good question, man, because I'm very much an introvert, but I'm also very much, I'm a Gemini through and through. So <laughs> I've got those two sides for sure. Um, and I do think on stage is, is a definitely is me. It's definitely an authentic version of me. It's just a overblown, you know, me. Cause I'm, you know, there's, 5,000 people out there and you gotta, you know, you gotta command them in some kind of way. And, you know, I love interacting with the people. That's kind of like yeah. the thing that I love to do. I think some artists get up there and they play their songs and they don't really address the crowd too much. And that's okay as well. Um, hold on a sec. And that's okay as well. But, you know, that's, ne that's never really been my, um, you know, my way. Sorry, the cleaning, the cleaning lady just got here. I was not aware. <laughs> All good. You know, for a band that has a big sound, you know, and you guys kind of uh, cross over between rock and roll, soul, funk, pop. I mean, all of it is sort of mixed together with you guys. But, you know, yep. it's not easy keeping a big band together. I mean, uh, <laughs> I have a group also with the revival in the name. Um Oh, I and love it. our group Dust Bowl Revival has been around for over 10 years. I've always wanted a seven, eight piece band. I mean, that's just always been the sound, the feeling that I want. I don't want to be a, a solo guitar player, uh, you know, telling my stories about my mom on the mic. I mean, that's fun, too. But um, it's fun, too. But yeah, no, I, I hear you playing with a lot of guys. Um, it's a it's, sacrifice that you have to make, I think, to really yeah. bring that sound. And people don't realize that they assume that like, oh, well, you started off as kind of a acoustic duo or something. And then once you got famous or something, then you have the money to pay all those people. But a lot of times you have to pay people and not pay yourself and get that sound into the world. Um, almost fake it till you make it type thing, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Tell me about the beginning of the group. Oh man. It was just, you know, a lot of hours spent in the, uh, you know, Chevy express. <laughs> a lot of a lot of nights sleeping on the floor, you know, of a hotel room with like three and four of us, you know, in a room. A lot of air mattresses, a lot of a lot of amazing family members and friends' couches. Yeah, um, we had a lot of help along the way, um, and we had a lot of hardship, you know. Um, but we really always just like we always believed in what we were doing, and that was really the thing that like kept us going, honestly. Um, and then we had, you know, a song that really kind of helped us continue. You know, yeah. You know, that happened like 10 years into our career. Cause I mean, we were just, you know, we, we were just total road dogs, you know, I mean, just right. 175, 200 shows a year up until that point. And honestly, I, that was not sustainable for me at all. Like I was yeah. just, I needed to, I needed to, something needed to give and i was just I'm, I'm just very grateful for you know that song um and just the time that it, you know it, it enabled us to kind of like be able to like actually sit back and take a little time to like okay yeah now what do we want to do <laughs> you know i played uh wish i knew you at full volume for my one and a half year old today um oh my it's man. just a it's just a jam. I mean, let's be real, you know. Um Thank you, man. It, it almost has like a disco beat, you know, that sort of um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. brother. You know. you know, when when George when we were making it in the in the practice room, George started that I mean it really for me, it's about that four on the floor and the bass line. Yeah. It just it waves across the tune and it was really just like that was the thing that I think really you know, made it something different. Like, it's really that, that I love that bass line, that tune, man. It's everything. Yeah, I mean, me. you know, Men Amongst Mountains comes out in 2015. How quickly was was it before people started catching on to that tune? Uh, It wasn't the first single, actually. It was the second one. We released Keep Going. And then I think it came out, like, in, like, 2016. Um, uh, we, we put, we, we sent the song to radio, and 
it didn't really it immediately caught but then it was like it was very organic how how it all kind of happened and it just you know it was just one of those tunes that just kind of raised his hand and started yeah. you know just organically connecting and we were just like oh shit this is happening wow i think i think what what draws me to a band like you guys um and i'll i'll be the first to admit i'm not um a huge fan of most of the pop music that is out right now um maybe i sound like a crotchety old man at this point I, maybe I, i've I, always been a crotchety old man but it's like no i mean acoustic okay. music acoustic music <laughs> that can become dance music is like my favorite music right that's the blues soul it's like stuff that you can play in a room with two people or in an arena with 70,000 people right and Absolutely. some of your you know songs that are bangers you know even this new single that's catching fire kid it's an acoustic song that becomes a freaking banger you know at 100% same thing yep same there's thing dynamics kid. there's like a, there's like a there's like a a, a volume rise that i feel like is really powerful cuz sometimes if it's just all synth and all uh you know electronic wizardry i i lose the human element Absolutely. of a lot of the new sort of uh pop songs like it feels like something that did david create this or did a robot create this i don't know uh, and, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and now especially with the you know with the invention of ai i feel yeah. like it's like i just feel like we're in an age where it's like you know, people, it's just like, I, I you know, the, the songwriting is going to have to be hyper specific, you yeah. know, for people to not be like, oh, was this just an AI song, you know? Right. And the, I don't even want to know what the, what's going to happen with the music, but I feel like there's going to be a huge pushback with the, you know, in the way that the, like, people are consuming and the way that lyrics are going to be written. Maybe there won't be, but I feel like that's going to be my response. I'm just like, I cannot, I just, I well, don't know about, I don't know about in the that. history in the history of American music and popular music, the trends you could see every, I don't know, 20 years, there is this resurgence of sort of a rustic blues folk sound swing. Yep. It's like, it becomes back around like clockwork because yep. people are like, wait, I want this Get something real tangible energy. Yeah. Right. And yep. The interesting thing I think is the 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 thematic thread I can see between Kid and Wish I Knew You is like you having a conversation through the past, almost like talking to a younger self or talking to a future self, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I, you know that that video for Wish I Knew You is so is so touching as you could see these folks who never maybe got to tell their high school sweetheart how much they meant. Right. Yep. You never got to say to that girl that rocked your world, hey, maybe we'll meet up again when we're 75 and I'm a dentist mm -hmm. or something, you know? Yeah, man. And, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, it's like you're telling this kid, maybe it's you, maybe it's your kid, you know, you got to like let it all hang out and don't leave anything to chance. Just fucking give yourself to the world, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And is that a conversation? to a version of you or, or to maybe someone listening? Like how does, what, where's the message going in kid? I think, I think, I mean, I do think it is, is a little bit of what you said about the, the, the message to a future self or potentially my future child or yeah. Zach's future child, you know, or Zach's children or, or the little boy inside, you know? Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Cause a lot of times, I don't necessarily know where it comes from. Um, I do know that when we were writing it, it felt, it almost felt, it had this thought of just like, it's it's kind of writing itself a little bit. And we're just mm -hmm. kind of like, we just got to get out of the way of this thing that just has presented itself to us. So that was really, really special. Um, and then, you know, we kind of, I think a lot of times we, we, you you kind of you come with these lines like just living for the spirit now and when when a line like that kind of comes in it also informs 
other things in the song, you know? So it's like, it was this really amazing, just like, we just kind of pieced it together slowly, yeah. but surely. Um, and we came up with something really beautiful. I'm just, I'm just really proud of Zach and I, that was the first time that we got together to write a song. Um, that was probably, I mean, definitely during, I mean, for, for sure during the pandemic, but it was, we hadn't probably written a tune in a year, year and a half, maybe gotten together mm -hmm. to write. So maybe even longer, honestly. So it was, it was a really, uh, it was a really special thing that it, that it, that's what happened the first time we got together. It's kind of like, what? And, and Zach Feinberg, the guitar player who you wrote with, you know, he was, his wife was pregnant with twins, right? At that, at yep. that point. Yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot, a lot at stake, right? You know, it's like, absolutely. I, you start right. I mean, that's, it is like a thing. Maybe it's almost cliche at this point, but like my songwriting um, vision, whoever the muse is, is now this little creature that almost didn't fully exist, you know, exactly. until she, she now, you know, she's kind of talking and, and running around, but these songs were written before she even arrived thinking about what she could be, who she was going to be, you know? Um, and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a crazy thing. Like your whole body chemistry changes, you know? Yeah. Like you're I like, this that. Is, I definitely this is could see a change now. in Zach. I could see a change in Zach for sure. And he'll tell you that. Yeah. He, he, it was like, you know, he definitely had a fire under him, you know, to come with something. And, you made it happen, you know, you made it happen. Pretty special. Now there's some, uh, there's some dark jams on this record. I mean, that, that single, I just heard the long con is, is like, yeah. it's almost like this, this angry mob of protesters, which we see in Nashville and all over the country, like yeah. yep. telling uh, the people around them, like, stop scamming me, like stop, yeah. gaslighting me you know stop yeah. stealing from me yeah. um and yeah. i mean that could mean a lot of things obviously financially or or otherwise but i feel like this whole debate about uh gun violence it feels like oh. you're, we're you're talking to a force that wants to take and take and take and there's nothing that you can convince them that um you cannot there's nothing you can say to convince them that it, all this money and profit is not worth our kids I just, and I, these innocent lives. Like what is wrong with you? It's sickening to me. I, I'll never understand it. And, you know, I just, you know, I think, you know, it's like, I don't even know what we can do at this point. Cause it just feels like everything that we're doing, it just, it just, everything falls on deaf ears mm -hmm. and all the protests. It's like, it's amazing. We got to protest and we can't let this become something that is, you know, just, we can't become numb to it, you know? So we got to continue to fight. Um, but I just feel like, I don't know. Like, I feel like we need to mobilize a little better or something. I feel like a lot of these groups, like a lot of these hate groups, they're very mobilized and they're yeah. very centered Focused. and it's like, yeah, they're very focused. And it's like, I feel like there's not necessarily that for the other side, the yeah. opposition, you know, which needs to be, you know. Um, so that's kind of where my head is at these days. I'm like, how do we how do we do that? Um, and I think it can be done. I think it can be done. Um, it just takes a leader. And it takes, you know, a voice. Was there was there a specific um event or situation that you saw in the news or, or heard about that prompted that long contract? Like what, what was the spark uh, from that? It was basically the, the Donald Trump years, <laughs> you know, it was that, it was that whole thing. And I was just so sick of ugh, every time that man would come on. I just, ugh, I just can't even, so it was a lot of that. Um, the song was written over uh, over a number of years, you know, and I just kept coming back to it, coming back to it, and coming back to it. And so it's got it's got a lot of different 
a, a lot of different things in there. Um, and I'm pulling from a lot of different instances, but it's interesting because it, it, it's like this, this stuff never ends, you know, right. this stuff, it just, it just keeps going and it keeps going. Um, but I did want there to be, I didn't want it to be all gloom and doom because I, that is not me. You know, I always want to have some, I'm a forever optimist. You know, I always want to have some kind of, some form of hope, you know, especially in the art that I make, you know? Right. Um, so that's what the chorus was all about. You know, I was like, I, this is, this has to be, this has to be something we can all sing together, mm -hmm. you know? And, just at least, you know, gather some energy from that. And hopefully, you know, that song turns some heads and, you know, I don't know. Like I said, I'm, I'm kind of focusing some energy right now on like, how do we, how do we mobilize a little bit better? When did you first start playing music? How young? I was 12. I got a little white K guitar and a 10, 10 watt amp. Bought it at uh, the little, the local, um, I think it was a, I think it was a music shop. I don't think it was a, uh, I think it was, yeah, it was a music shop. Um, but yeah, I, all I wanted to do was play teen spirit. I was, I was of that, um, you know, that I was a nineties kid. I was a nineties kid through and through. <laughs> You remember the first record that you bought yourself? Um, first record. I have a memory of buying. Um, I don't know if this was the first record. Okay, I have a good memory of buying in utero at Walmart. Yeah. Um, but I will say I had a tape of. Uh, Never mind, and I mm -hmm. played it. I played it until it wouldn't play anymore. Like I, I like it. Like it. Like uh, <laughs> you know, played it out. Basically, it just wouldn't. Yeah, it wouldn't play anymore. Yeah. So that was that was interesting. But yeah, big fan of that. I had my sisters to kind of help guide my musical tastes too. So they were uh, they were heavily in influencing me with Tool and and. Uh, and my other sister was very much into like the jam scene. So she was like, you know, hipping me to the Grateful Dead and Fish. Mm. So I was kind of getting it from all sides. I was like, you know, I was like, a, I was like, I was like 11 year old. I was 11 year old going to their, well, I was at my house and they were having parties while my parents were gone. So it was like, it was a good time. It was a good time. Don't tell mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> exactly you grew up in uh, in ohio right yep yep what brought you down to new orleans uh, uh it was it was i had just graduated college and i was um i was gonna do it you know i was working in construction at the time and katrina had just hit um and i was like okay you know and it was it's easy for me to get a job down in new orleans so i i worked I, I came down here obviously i knew about the music scene i didn't didn't know at how amazing it was right but i quickly learned um and i really you know it was just i i worked for the local uh i worked for the uh for a gas company that had the contract to basically redo all of the gas line for the city mm. so i was i was laying pipe for for four to five years um wow yeah, and going on tour and then, but yeah, so that was, it was basically just, you know, I came down here kind of on a whim, mm. you know, I was always doing music though, you know, on the side, it was just my passion, you know, still is. <clears throat> was there a gig or a tour, like a moment where you were like, okay, something's really happening here. Something special is, is taking off here. Uh, like a show where you're yeah. like, I think, I think this could really work. Yeah. The, one of the first towns um, was Pensacola, Florida, that kind of like popped up as like a place that was like a, oh, wow. Like people are really coming out to see us. Yeah. 
this is a thing. Um, so it was kind of like we we did some we played this show these shows these like epic four hour shows um, at this place called Bamboo Willies. It was on the beach, and oh my god, those shows were just whew, hot hot um but some of like the funnest shows i feel like we've ever played because they were just free and just crazy and i mean it was just such a a youthful energy you know it was good i uh kind of lost my voice for a month or so in february and i went to this ent and in like a throat specialist here in la because i was you know i was kind of freaked out yeah and it wasn't recovering and I was like, look, I'll, I'll admit to you, I've been singing in rock and roll and soul and bands since I was 13. No training. Um, yeah. And the guy's like, yeah, you probably should have come to me nine years ago or so. But uh, I think we can fix you up. <laughs> I mean, there's I how many that. shows, how many shows like that we did four sets, you know, where you're singing with barely any monitors. It's amazing exactly. that any of us can talk at this point, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm so with you. Yeah, I have to I have to do a lot to take care of my my voice at this point. For sure. Do you have I, a pre-show like, ritual like brother, a warm up? I just I just even to this just today I was like, man, I got to cut back on my coffee. So all I've had today <laughs> is a green tea, a green tea. <laughs> and I'm feeling but, it, god damn it. I don't know, right? Um pre-show ritual uh, uh I would say no ritual. I kind of, I honestly want, I want it to feel as normal as possible. I don't want to feel like I'm, you know, I just want to have a normal conversation. I just want to just, you know, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to like, I just want to feel normal. Cause it's like, it's enough of an energy when you hit the stage. Right. I'm just, it's like, whoa, you know, I don't, yeah. It's like, I, yeah, I don't like need to, I do need to warm up. That's one of the things I have to do. For sure. Um, do you do scales? Do you really do the trills? Steam? I don't warm up. These, all these, you know, I'm talking about really weird sounds. All those little... Mm. All those, yeah, all those. All those, yeah. Definitely. I do. And, and now, at this point, I'm also using a, um, a vocal mister. I got one of those. Humidifier. Um, that's been really, really helpful. Big time. Well, I think the thing that has been interesting talking to this vocal specialist is that my speaking voice should really be up here, right? A lot of people, especially guys, they speak way down here because that's the manly, forceful thing to do, but it's grinding your vocal cords a lot, whereas really you're actually naturally speaking here but you don't want to be perceived as like weak in society so you speak down here and it's kind of grinding and grinding you know and that's what kills me is the like talking and yelling before and after the show you know you're in a loud bar you're going out to eat you're hanging out and then you realize like i feel vocally fatigued and i haven't even sung a note yet Exactly. So yeah. shutting the hell up is the hardest uh, thing for me. Uh, 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 on tour, I often just vocal rest. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, that's well, interesting because, like, treats. on on Spotify, right? You don't get to choose what people are listening to, how people find you, right? So you look at your page. Soul Fight from 2008, still rocking hard in the number three spot, right? That song, uh, yeah, that's crazy. That one, that's another one. We never, yeah, it was just, that one just connected in a really profound way. It's probably the, it's probably the fan favorite. I mean, even over Wish I Knew You, honestly. Really? I think Wish wow. I Knew I think it's just, I think Wish I Knew You is just bigger because it, it got a lot of, you know, people just know it because it got big on the radio and right. all that kind of thing. But I think like if you maybe if you might ask like our core fan group, what's their favorite tune? 
you might it might be the overwhelming majority might say so fine i feel like like if I we mean, don't it's... play that song at a show people get pissed yeah <laughs> yeah but there's times where you feel almost embarrassed by previous work you know where yeah. you're like look that was a that was a version of me as a songwriter yep. that i don't really yeah. want to keep bringing out but again it's like the songs exist on their own plane right it yep. hits someone in pensacola and they they need to hear it you know um how do you put together a set do you do you have a fixed sort of uh set that you do on a certain tour does it change night to night um it changes a bit night to night we have kind of like what i like to do is like i kind of like to couple songs together so like there's uh -huh. kind of like groupings of songs and they can like kind of move throughout the set you know um a lot of times it's like energies basically or keys the, those right. songs will kind of stick together so we can kind of like so there's not much you know, you can let the let the last note ring and it sounds right just going into the next tune you know um so there's not too much awkwardness between songs uh but yeah it definitely changes from night to night um we usually like to do some bust outs you know on tour songs that we haven't played in a long time we'll definitely do that um from night to night uh but yeah on, on our toes a lot of times it's like we're you know if we put a new record out it's like we're just playing the new stuff mostly and then we'll pepper in you know the right. previous record and some older things along the way you know the deal what do you think the weirdest most unexpected cover that you guys have ever whipped out hmm hmm it was funny. We started playing uh, Breakfast in America by Super Tramp a few years ago. And like people have heard that on classic rock radio that take a look at my girlfriend. Right. But like they don't really yeah. know <laughs> Super Tramp is not like one of those bands that you're always talking about, like Led Zeppelin or Bruce Springsteen or something. So underrated. But young kids under probably 30 assume that that was our song. Oh, wow. And they were asking us, like, oh, so which record can I get this on? Because that was, like, the best song you're set. I was like, yeah, mom and dad didn't play Super Tramp for you, huh? All right. Uh, shit. <laughs> yeah, shit. Yeah, um, I, I, I honestly, I'd have to say it was uh, it's Forgot About Dre by Dr. Dre. That's probably okay. the most left, left field cover we've ever done. And it's crazy. There's some places we'll go, and that's, that's all they want to hear. <laughs> I they become done, too I powerful haven't... sometimes the, the, they yeah, they take over a set it. exactly it, it's uh i mean we do we do it like differently you know we do it kind of like like you know just like a rock band would do it i don't even you know but we haven't done it in a while i don't know if we'll ever, ever do it again but i'm not closing the door on it. let's just say that you know there's not a vibe there's a vibe on some of this uh, new record that feels um, bear with me on this. If ZZ top the who and Billy Joel got together in the eighties and we're like, let's jam, yeah. let's jam and put out some crazy shit. Cause you got that like Clarence Clemens sax coming in out of nowhere a few times, like on don't look back. Good old days. Yeah, yeah. I'll take that, dude. Hell you got yeah. this like simmering synth thing, but still with the real instruments, thank God, behind it yep. all, you know? Uh, especially Don't Look yep. Back. I'm like, hmm, I, I hear some ZZ Top, maybe some early Who. Like, hell yeah, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. <clears throat> that was, uh, we recorded that one. Everything you hear on there was basically just like, that's what we played. Absolutely. That was like, that's the take. That's it. There was like no I'm trying to think. The only thing that was like really overdubbed much was um were the background vocals. That was it. We and we record, you know, we had to we had to get our peeps here from New Orleans on that stuff. So <clears throat> but yeah, that was that was just a that was an end of the night kind of 
situation. Yeah. You're like, all right, you got three left in you. All right. What's the BPM of the song in the demo? 160. All right. Put it to 170. Let's go. <laughs> put it to 190. Yeah, right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we, we recorded uh the Beatles um song Oh Darling, which is one of my all time favorites. And it was like one in the morning. Like we were almost like gonna give up for the night. We're like, yeah, but we we thought we were gonna do that. We gotta get this down. Yep. And there's like that slightly unhinged feeling, you know, mm -hmm. in the room, which I kind of love. Like the ending just falls apart. <laughs> completely. Which is good sometimes, you know. I think that like if you listen to some of the Stones stuff, especially their live recordings, it's just like, what happened? Yeah. Well, it's cool. It doesn't even matter. It's the, it's the Rolling Stones, you know. Yeah. Good stuff. When when you sing a song like "Good Old Days," that phrase in itself is sort of ironic, right? Because as soon as you're saying something is like yeah. "This is the time that's the best," it means that everything going forward <laughs> is downhill in a way. Like that right? this yeah. is my peak, <laughs> you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and again, the Springsteen connection is really there for me, you know, because he has that that classic song, um, "Glory um, Days." Glory days, you know, which I love, yeah. where he's like, you know, well, he was a baseball player and she was yep. wearing yeah. those tight blue jeans. <laughs> you know, we actually covered that tune one time in New Jersey. We learned it the day of the show. I feel like we didn't do it justice, but we tried. Yeah, it was a bold move. Let's just say. But I think a lot of the the classic rock that we grew up listening to, our parents, you know, sort of it was their pop music is steeped in this like this is the greatest time in history feeling yeah. and like yeah. we now have to reconcile like wait but does that mean that we're in the downhill part of our parents lives you know I know. like what about our good, really good old days <laughs> yeah it, we have good old days yeah i mean it's it is yeah exactly i feel like they yeah the 50s I feel like and 60s definitely are so romanticized, right? You have this summer of yeah. love thing. It's like, oh, the romanticism yeah. and the and the civil rights movement. And now we're kind of in the fallout times. <laughs> uh -huh. I know. I just feel like, yeah, there was a little bit of like ignorance is bliss going on. And now it's like, I feel like we're just, you know, living in the age of climate change. And we've had, we've got all this, like these things that are potentially going to be really, really, harmful to all of us if we don't turn them around yeah. um so yeah i don't yeah i mean it's a hopeful tune you know i just i hope that i hope you know i mean i feel good and i and it's like i want to feel that way you know i want to i want to believe that this is the time and it will always be the time if i can you know continue to live my life and you know, put out the good energy that I'm, you know, know I'm always capable of and just, you know, continue to do, do the right thing, do, do the things, you know, for myself that, you know, that are meaningful and, you know, for my fellow friends and my family and my bandmates. Um, yeah. Well, in you know, many it's ways, a, it's a, it's a hopeful thing. I mean, it feels good. In many ways, you know, if you go back to when you're laying pipe, doing construction trying to do music as this pipe dream literally that was awkward but i had to say it um <laughs> where music for most people is a pipe dream right it's like a thing that you yeah, it, it, really yeah. love doing after hours you know i used to work in an advertising office i would have rehearsals after we you know finished shooting the burger king commercial in the freaking office you know and yep it felt like this thing that it was like secret, like it was just ours, you know, but then I got laid off and then we start touring and, and it becomes like a real thing. And the, some of the fun goes out of it when it's your job, you know, and you're yeah. having to literally provide jobs for all these other people, you know, yeah. and if your song doesn't catch on and your uh, thing doesn't work, then you screw yourself and all these other people. Like the pressure is real and you guys have a full on machine in place here. Right. I mean, you're playing yeah. 
you know, probably what a thousand, two thousand a night on the road. Like three to seven. Yeah. So I mean that yeah. that's that is a that that's a heavy uh yeah. you know responsibility in a way, which people again just assume like, well, you're you're yeah. living that rock star life, David. That's yeah, exactly. that's it. Yeah, there's uh, yeah, it's like it there's was a honest, whole thing. It was a lot it was a lot easier. It was a lot easier in some respects to do it um when no one knew or really gave a shit. You right, because like no pressure. Now, it's just we're just having fun. No pressure. Yeah. So now there's like you know I, now I have the pressure to be, you know, David Shaw or whatever. You know. So it's just like that can play a role in in how how you know on your you know just can play a role in your mental. Um. Did you worry? Did you worry that there wouldn't be another hit type song like "Wish I Knew You"? Like, what if? nothing like that ever yeah. happened again uh, i mean i'm i don't necessarily i didn't i didn't worry per se um but it is an interesting thing because it's like well now here's this here's this thing that happened right um it's very rare for it to happen ever to anyone it's like yeah extreme, extremely rare and is even you know i was honestly just like well if it never happens again it's okay honestly yeah um we've built a following up i'm able to tour i'm able to you know do a lot of different things um i have the security of the the song you know that you know it's still people play it a lot so it's like i'm I'm still able to you know do my art and so there i mean yeah in the back of my mind am i going oh man it would be nice to have another one of those heck yeah um <laughs> yeah does it yeah did it affect i think there was a time where it kind of messed with my head i think yeah. you know i think it, that's just being real for sure um but did i really i i, I think i got i came to the conclusion that you know it's just i'm just gonna continue to do my art and you know we're just gonna continue to be a band and you know, put out the, the things that we, you know, feel that are meaningful to us. And if it connects at the end of the day, then that's great. You know, if it doesn't, that's okay too. Um, but we believe in it and that's all right. You know? Amen, Brad. Amen. Before we go, can you uh, maybe introduce the folks who are in the band and maybe say what you think their unique superpower is? Oh, I like that. All right. Um, okay, we'll, we'll we'll start with Zach. He plays guitar. He he also writes in the band. I think his unique superpower would be he has an innate ability to see through bullshit. It's a good superpower. I, um, so you can piss some people important. off who are bullshitters, you know. But it's good to have. <laughs> yeah, who cares though? We were, <laughs> get them out of here. Oh, uh, let's see here. Um, Andrew, our drummer, one of our drummers, Andrew Campanelli. Um, he's a, a very creative person, very beyond just playing the drums. He's a great songwriter and um, an amazing uh, visual artist. He uh, draws, mm. so I think that I think that's one of his superpowers. Like I can't, you know, that would be what I would say for him. Um, let's see here, um, PJ. We'll start with PJ. Uh, or not, we'll, we'll go to PJ. He's the other drummer and percussion player. I would say that his superpower is just the energy that he brings to our group and just to mm. a room is it's the kind that just, you know, you want to bottle up and just have it with you at all times. Mm. The guy is just, uh, PJ stands for pure joy. You know, he's got a really special energy, man. And, um, we're really grateful to have him on the team. Um, let's see here. Michael Gerardo, keys and trumpet. This man knows how to rock a spreadsheet. The most organized person I, I, I know. Um, nice. <laughs> that's, a, that's a superpower, I'd have to say, because I just don't get down with those things. Um, so he, he, he's helpful in a lot of ways, for sure. Um, let's see here. George Geekus. Our bass player. 
I'd have to say his his superpower is man, he just he knows he knows how to play that bass line just just right, you know, mm. not too stiff, not too loose. Just lay it back right in the right in the cut, right where it's just like, ah, okay. I like that. That's tasty. Um Ed Williams, pedal steel. His superpower is humor. He's a funny mm. guy. Probably the funniest guy in our band. Some some of the guys might say differently, but I think he's probably I think he's the funniest guy in the band. For sure. And that's an important energy to have. Yeah, man. Especially when you're on the road, you know, things get tough. You need a funny guy. Yeah. You know? So I'd say that's his, that's Ed's superpower. Rob Ingram, the last one. Um, he plays sax. Uh, his superpower is he is a novelist hiding in a saxophone player's body. The I guy... See is an incredible writer and one day i will say that he i mean if he's not writing a book at this point or has been just slowly i'd say he's doing himself a disservice but i know that one day he's probably going to write a book or books just feels like the the natural progression i mean the guy is just amazing um so yeah there we go and finally, your superpower is. Oh my gosh! Oh god. Um, I think I'm an, a very intuitive person. I think I have a, an ability to kind of like read a room really well and and read a person's energy and connect to you know whoever I'm talking to in a meaningful way. And I think that's uh something that i uh something that i do i would say yeah man well uh pour it out into the night it's about to hit the world by storm let's go really excited for folks to hear this and um just take us out with uh down in the dirt because again it it feels like something you could play right on your porch where you're sitting in new orleans right now but then just all of a sudden goes into the dance party you know, Woo! yep, you got that right, my man. And and that's that's uh that's my favorite kind of music, man. It takes a left turn, and all of a sudden you're on the dance floor. Yep, me too. I'm I'm totally with that, man. Yeah, I got to give all the credit to Zach on that one. He's the he's he's the man. He's the man with the pen on that one. Um, it's a really special song, really special song. When he brought it to the band, I, I think we were all just like, wow. Love this one. This is this is a tune. See, you know, happy to sing it. You know, I think a lot of times it's like I don't sing a ton of songs that other people have written. You know, I I've really got to like connect to the tune. Mm-hmm. And Zach, I think, has a, a, a really a, an amazing ability to you know just write you know from the heart, and it just happens. You know, I don't know if he's, I don't think he's writing for me. I think he's just writing from his heart and it just yeah. seems to be connected to me, you know? So it's awesome. It's good. Every year um, we do a April Fool's fake post on our band Dust Bowl Revival's, you know, socials. Yep. People forget about April Fool's every single year. It cracks me up. I, and uh... I, I've made them more and more elaborate with like real graphics and this whole thing. But I did this thing about four or five years ago. I don't know if you guys even saw it, but it was like, hey, we're we're launching our first, you know, music festival called the Revival Revival, right? It's only bands with revival in the name, right? <laughs> so it's like, because at, at a certain point, there was like seven bands that we knew touring, you know, it was like, we, had- we got Dust Bowl Revival, we got Trout Steak Revival, we got the Revivalists, we got... um Folk Soul Revival. We got Dirty Revival. Soul yep. Revival. We got, you know. Elephant Revival. Elephant Revival and headlining John Fogarty bringing back Credence Clearwater Revival. And like, Revival. <clears throat> we yeah. had this we had this whole fake poster and like, you know, like it's going to be on the beach in Santa Monica, like underneath the, the Ferris wheel. <laughs> and people like 
were like furious that they couldn't buy tickets. Like, where's the presale link, bro? <laughs> What's happening? Oh my god! I want to see the revivalists it, and John I mean, Fogarty. That... Let's go. Me too. Oh my god! <laughs> Not real, unfortunately. Actually, I had to. I had to take uh, our our poster down. I got a cease and desist this year, even though it blew up because I said we were. We were playing at the White House with this list of bands as Joe Biden's like favorite music or something. Oh my God. And this one band's like, wow. I can't be associated with this. Like it's we don't do politics. I was like, it's a joke. Oh, come Lord. on. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> oh my oh, god. Oh well. Well, keep up the good work, man. Maybe we'll get all the revival bands together one day. Hey. Sounds like it sounds like a good idea, if you ask me. <laughs> All right, man. Keep up the good work. Absolutely, brother. Good to talk to you. Thank you, man. Take it easy.